Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our pediatric dentistry series. In this video, we will talk about dental trauma in children. So first, let's go over a basic outline of traumatic dental injuries. We have our minor injuries, which include concussion, craze lines, enamel fractures, and enamel and dentin fractures. So these are our Ellis class one and class two fractures. And these minor injuries overall involve a low cost of treatment, minor interventions, have a good prognosis, and require just a short-term follow-up. Next, we have moderate injuries, which involve subluxations and enamel, dentin, and pulp fractures. So fractures that are more complicated and involve the nerve of the tooth. These are our Ellis class three and class four fractures. So moderate injuries, particularly this more complicated fracture, introduces a higher cost, more complex intervention. Typically endodontic treatment is involved like a sphec pulpotomy, a full pulpotomy, or even a pulpectomy. It has more of a guarded prognosis and requires a longer term follow-up. And then we have our major injuries, which are our luxations, intrusion, extrusion, and lateral luxation, avulsions, alveolar fractures, and crown and root fractures. So these are going to be our Ellis class five and class six fractures. They involve a high cost, major multi-specialty interventions, have a reduced or poor prognosis, and require a long-term follow-up. So here are some great high yield facts to know for the board exam. Boys are more, more often impacted by dental trauma than girls. The maxillary anterior teeth are the most commonly involved. And an increased overjet that's greater than six millimeters specifically has a higher risk of dental trauma. So children with increased overjet are more at risk because the upper teeth are way out in front of the lower teeth. So they're more vulnerable to trauma and there's just more opportunity to knock into those front teeth. So when a patient comes to the clinic with dental trauma, there are some relevant medical history questions that we really need to ask them. We ask, do they have any coagulation disorders? And we're thinking about bleeding risk. Do they have tetanus coverage? So tetanus is caused by a bacterial infection, which can be inflicted by a puncture wound, or even if you fall into the dirt, for example. So we wanna make sure that the patient is covered with the tetanus vaccine. The active immunization is three Tdap vaccines. It covers tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis during the first year of age, a booster at 1.5, three, and six years, and then every four to five years after that. So if they're uncovered, they really need to get a tetanus antitoxin, but if there's dated coverage, they can get a tetanus booster. We really importantly want to rule out a head injury. If they've had trauma, there's a good chance that they hit their head to some degree. So we perform some neurologic assessment of drowsiness, amnesia, and blurred vision. So you ask, how many fingers am I holding up to examine their state of consciousness, want to check for their speech, look at their eyes, do they have ptosis or drooping of the eyelids, is there any dizziness, do they feel nauseous, are they vomiting, do they have any sort of amnesia, do they remember what happened, and if they have any of these signs, tell them that their teeth are minor and to go to the ER to get tested for a head injury, which can be much, much more serious. And regardless of the severity of the injury, we would like to see them for follow-ups, ideally one, two, and six months after the incident to check in on the healing and how they're doing afterwards. All right, so let's go into a little bit more in depth on some of the specific injuries that we talked about before. So we have concussion and subluxation of primary teeth. Concussion is where the periodontal ligament becomes sore, the tooth was knocked into, but the tooth wasn't displaced and there's no increased mobility. 
Subluxation is where the PDL actually rips and bleeds. There's some mobility, but still no displacement of the tooth. So we really, in this situation, just want to let the tooth rest. Any kind of splint is really overkill for a primary tooth, so no treatment is typically recommended. But we would recommend the patient to maintain a soft diet, to let those teeth rest and relax, not biting into anything really hard like a whole apple or something like that. We want to reinforce good oral hygiene. It might be a little bit sore, but we still want them to take care of their teeth. And teeth with open apices are more likely to remain vital after this trauma. And that's kind of true for any situation. If we have any sort of trauma, typically a tooth with an open apex that hasn't completed development has a better chance of remaining vital. That goes for permanent teeth as well. And follow-ups, as we mentioned before, one to six months might be a little bit overkill for more of a minor injury like concussion, but if you're at subluxation level, it's probably a good idea to maintain that follow-up regimen. All right, so next we have intrusion of the primary teeth. This is apical displacement of the tooth into the socket. So primary anterior teeth are typically positioned labial to their permanent successors. We can see that in this image here. So if they do get knocked into and intruded, they tend to get displaced in this manner and kind of slide against the labial surface of that tooth when they get banged into. So for intrusion of a primary tooth, there's actually no treatment recommended, and we hope that they would spontaneously re-erupt into a more functional position. This is also true for uh, permanent teeth that have open apices. No treatment, and we hope that they spontaneously re-erupt. We talked about that in our endodontic series, I think, quite a, quite a while ago. Now, this is why we talked about tooth development in our very first video in the series, because those fundamental concepts come up again and again in pediatric dentistry when studying for the boards. And here they are again. When we have intrusion of the primary tooth, it can affect and damage the developing permanent teeth that are underlying it. So we can get hypoplasia if this happens during apposition, we can get hypocalcification if it occurs during calcification, and if it happens even later during development, we can get dilaceration, which is bending of that root, if the permanent tooth was at that time undergoing root formation. So that's pretty neat. We can imagine that if you bang into the permanent tooth in this way, that permanent tooth developing bud with the developing root gets bent as it gets knocked into and then the root just kind of is permanently bent in that direction. So it kind of makes sense depending on where you're at in the tooth development cycle what will happen as a result of the trauma. So follow-ups again are going to be recommended. Now what about the opposite? What if we have extrusion of the primary tooth? That means that the primary tooth has been partially extruded out from the socket, as we see here. So the greater the distance of luxation, the greater the chance of severing the apical vasculature and having, as a result, pulpal necrosis. If the tooth is extruded more than three millimeters, we actually recommend extracting and then maintaining space for that primary tooth. But if the patient is seen before formation of a periapical blood clot, we can reposition that tooth carefully, place a flexible splint for about one to two weeks, and then perform any endodontic treatment that might be necessary at that time. Then again, follow-ups would be recommended as well. Now, what if the tooth is avulsed? So that means the primary tooth has been completely separated from its alveolus, and it's now out of the mouth. So replantation of a permanent tooth is typically what you'd want to do if it has been not too long after the traumatic incident, but replantation of a primary tooth has a particularly poor prognosis. If it's been less than 30 minutes of 
what we call extra alveolar dry time. That's the amount of time a tooth has been outside of the mouth and not in some bathing solution like saline or milk, for example. So if, that's, if it's less than 30 minutes that it's been dry out of the mouth and out of solution, we could attempt to replant it, place a flexible splint for one or two weeks, and then we would recommend the patient to maintain a soft diet, take some, a course of antibiotics, and undergo endodontic treatment once that tooth has been in position for a little while and seems to be uh, regenerating the periodontium and everything like that just fine. It's most likely going to need some sort of endodontic treatment for sure. If it's been greater than 30 minutes outside of the mouth though, we really have no other option unfortunately other than keep the tooth out of the mouth and then maintain that space as needed for the per permanent tooth to come in. Of course, the good news here is that maybe the tooth was knocked out and that permanent tooth is just ready to come in already, in which case we really don't need to maintain space and that crown will take the space just fine. Okay, so let's take it up a notch. What if we have crown fracture of that primary tooth? So we can see that it could be a little bit more of a minor fracture just involving enamel or dentin. But again, remember the enamel of the primary teeth is thinner and the pulp is relatively larger. So the chance that you're gonna have a crown fracture that involves pulp is going to be greater in a primary tooth. If it's just enamel that's involved, we can smooth that out to the patient's comfort. Enamel and dentin, we can restore it to their aesthetic and cosmetic liking. If it's enamel, dentin, and pulp though, we're going to need some sort of endodontic treatment if we want to maintain that primary tooth. Pulpotomy if it's vital, pulpectomy if it's non-vital, and extract if there's pathologic root resorption that we're noticing in the x-rays. So this is kind of hearkening back to our primary tooth treatment video. We talked about that a series of things we need to consider and it kind of directs us to these three options. So a little nice for a review there. And then we can have root fracture of that primary tooth. This is actually pretty rare due to the malleability of the bone in a young patient. So it's more likely that we're gonna have some sort of crown fracture, something coronal happening than apical, which is good news. So typically if we do have a root fracture, if it's in the apical half, so if the fracture occurs in the apical half of the root, we would recommend no treatment and just let that root tip resorb physiologically as that permanent tooth comes in. But if the, the fracture is in the coronal half of the root, then we could consider some sort of rigid splint to hold that coronal portion of the tooth in place, or we would recommend extracting that tooth and again, maintaining space depending on where that underlying permanent tooth is. All right, so what can we do to prevent this stuff from happening? Mouth guards are incredibly helpful in preventing the frequency and severity of dentoalveolar injuries, and it's really true. And there are a couple different options um, for, for getting mouth guards. I highly recommend them for kids who play contact sports contact sports specifically, and especially if they're unsupervised, the risk of having some sort of traumatic injury is pretty high. Again, especially if they're going to have that overjet of greater than six millimeters. So you can take, you can use a stock mouth guard that's available at sporting goods stores on Amazon, and they're relatively inexpensive. That's just kind of something that it's made to one size and hopefully it fits not really the best option, so one step up from that would be the mouth-formed mouth guards. These are also available at sporting goods stores, and you could probably find them on online retailers as well. They have the boil and bite versions. That's where they're softened in hot water. You kind of boil this water, you throw it in, it gets soft, and then you try it in your mouth and mold it to your teeth. One really important thing to note with these boil and bite ones is never use them when you have braces on. 
because if you bite into them while they're boiling, if they're, while they're really, really, while the plastic is really, really hot, you're going to melt the the rubber ligatures around the brackets to the mouth guard and it's going to be a big mess. So definitely that's one thing you don't want to use if you have braces on. You can also get a shell mouth guard. So that's where you have a firm outer shell and then an inner liner that's softer of ethyl methacrylate. And lastly, of course, the best thing would be something that's custom fit to your child's mouth. And so you'd have an impression taken by a dental professional, and then they'd have a uh, cast or a model that they could vacuum form a mouth guard, or you could use a pressure laminated material with multiple layers. And so something that's custom fit will fit the best, but if you want to go one step down from that, the mouth formed is a better option. Uh, certainly a better option than the stock mouth guard. All right, so this is just a brief review of root resorption. We've talked about this in uh, several of our other series, but we have our internal root resorption where the odontoblastic layer and the pulp is damaged, and we have our external root resorption where the cementoblastic layer and the PDL has been damaged. So root resorption, I mentioned pathologic root resorption is certainly something that could happen if a child or any patient for that matter experiences a traumatic dental injury. There are various different forms of external root resorption. There is surface replacement, which is essentially ankylosis. We have inflammatory, cervical, and apical. You can feel free to read through those. Nice definitions to know for the board exam. And lastly, we have child abuse and neglect. And unfortunately, this is something that happens and can be a cause of traumatic dental injuries. Child abuse occurs uh, in all socioeconomic levels, and about 30% of abused and neglected children will later abuse their own children. So it's a really unfortunate cycle. And ages zero to three are most commonly abused or neglected. And the types of abuse to know for the board exam are physical, which involve intentional injuries, emotional, which involves denial of affection or isolation, so that's also a form of abuse, and neglect, which is willful negligence to provide basic needs of a child. So for example, if parents or caregivers aren't or are refusing to bring their patients, their, their children in for dental exams when they know that they need to have regular dental checkups. Dentists are required by law this is really important to know for the board exam, to report suspected child abuse and neglect, even if there's no hard proof. So dentists are required by law to report if they suspect, if they notice some odd bruising patterns or some dental trauma, like we talked about, some intrusion, extrusion, root fracture, crown fracture, they're not playing any sports, they didn't get in a fight at school, something's not really quite adding up, but you don't have cold hard proof, it's still required by law to report suspected abuse. All right, everyone, so that's it for this video. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you learned something new and it helped you study for the board exam. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and subscribe to this channel for much more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting this channel and donating to the cause, please check out my Patreon page Thank you to Michael Raja, Reb Boyd, Leonella Bunger, Zahir Anani, Riha Wadwa, David Jaden, Isabella Caldas, Ali Benjir, Badir Hefnawi, and all of my patrons for their support. You can unlock extras like access to these video slides if you want to take notes on them, and practice questions for the board exams with answers that I explain. So go check that out if it interests you. The link is in the description below. Thanks again for watching everyone, and I'll see you in the next video.